The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Devin Walsh, co-founder of the Uniswap Foundation. Together, we dive into the Uniswap ecosystem, discussing the foundation's mission, its short and long-term goals, and how the Uniswap Foundation is allocating capital via grants to support the growth of Uniswap as a developer platform. We speak about the significance of Uniswap v4 and hooks as the protocol pushes forward in becoming the liquidity layer of the internet. We address the current state of Uniswap's decentralization and explore the composition and recent developments related to Uniswap's key stakeholders, so developers, LPs, traders, token holders, and delegates. Finally, we conclude with Devin's insights on Uniswap's responses to regulatory challenges and its vision for the future. Tune in for a deep dive into the fundamentals of Uniswap. Hey, Devin, welcome to the Fundamentals Podcast. It is great to have you on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise, as you mentioned right before I click the recording button that so much focus around Uniswap is around Uniswap Labs. But outside of that, it is such a thriving ecosystem that it's going to be great to get to learn a bit more about Uniswap Foundation and also everything else that's going on within that ecosystem. So before we start diving into the details, it would be awesome if you could just quickly explain to anyone not yet familiar what the Uniswap Foundation is, its purpose, and how it fits into this thriving Uniswap ecosystem. Sure. So thank you again for having me. Ex- excited to be here to talk about all of the things that the foundation has been up to until today and, and how we're thinking about the future. The foundation, for folks who are listening who aren't already aware, is a nonprofit, specifically a, a grant-making nonprofit that I co-founded with my co-founder, Ken Ng, in the summer of 2022. So about a, a year and a half ago or so. And we founded it because we both saw, both in in my position as chief of staff at Uniswap Labs, where I took on the role as an ecosystem liaison, working with builders and delegates in the ecosystem, and Ken in his position as the leader and, and founder of the Uniswap Grants Program, saw early success of programs like the Grants Program and of builders and, and others in the ecosystem um, outside, outside of labs who were taking research projects and turning them into venture-backed startups, for instance. And we saw a much bigger opportunity to 100x the number of developers building on the protocol to really broaden and increase the amount of support, both in terms of capital, but also, you know, coordination, networking, support in, you know, connecting those folks to other builders and in the realm to VCs, et cetera, to support them in their ability to build for the long term. So ultimately, we could see many successful builders and companies building on the protocol. And I think that that really excited us from the perspective of further decentralizing the, the protocol. I think we're all in the space because we're excited about the idea of totally permissionless protocols and, and codes that anyone can build on with commitments that, that they won't change. And seeing that fully through to, to its potential was, was a really cool idea and opportunity for us. So we founded the foundation with the goal to support and strengthen the Uniswap ecosystem a year and a half ago. We recently received an additional $30 million in grant-making capital to support us for the next two years. And that is where we're psyched. We, ha- we have a lot of fun stuff on our roadmap. That is awesome. So the mission to support and build out the Uniswap ecosystem. To, to kind of summarize the goals, both short and long term, well, what would you say they are? Yeah, sure. So I think the ultimately our mission, as you know, stated, is to support and strengthen the Uniswap ecosystem. And you might say, okay, well, why? Who cares? Well, what benefit do I get from that? Because Uniswap is a permissionless protocol, but also a stateful protocol protocol where you have, you know, liquidity is is something that is of value to folks building on top of it, to swappers, et cetera. There are very strong network effects that are are held within the protocol for each incremental project, builder, developer, researcher who builds a POC on top of the protocol, bringing in net new order flow to the protocol. And so Building an ecosystem is not just something that sounds good and, and feels good and maybe feels, you know, it, it is very philosophically aligned with this idea of, you know, decentralization and in creating incredibly neutral protocols. 
But it's also something that is very value accretive to to the protocol and other builders building on top. So in the short term, what we are doing to contribute to those flywheels and contribute to the network effects is, well, one, we are currently in the process of revamping our grant making uh, program, which I can go into a bit later, but essentially making fewer but larger, very strategic, proactive, long-term oriented grants across a few verticals, but with three core themes. One, um, a core theme is is focused on researchers, academics, PhDs, essentially building the pipeline of the best ideas, folks thinking about how to solve the biggest existential questions facing DeFi and DEXs specifically, and supporting them. And and, you know, guiding them in, in their research with, with the end goal resulting in hopefully POCs built on top of Uniswap potentially as hooks. Two is focused on developers, the builders, the folks who take those, those ideas that the researchers have or who take their own ideas, how to speak to users within a given jurisdiction, how to serve a given asset class, real world assets, other like social tokens, other kinds of digital assets, which may be coming on chain speak to specific user types from institutional capital, the asset managers of the world, the newbie retail swapper who we can build for them and making Uniswap the easiest, most fun, best place to develop. So those both, you know, the, the idea there is that serving both of those kinds of users leads to one, they, they're very sticky, you know, developers, once they're settled within an ecosystem that, you know, integrations are sticky developers are sticky, communities are sticky, if successful, leads to net new order flow, which raises all boats, doesn't just benefit them, but actually contributes to increased TBL, more, you know, depth of, of order books or, or more, more TBL, less slippage to serve every other builder on the, on the protocol. So I think that really excites us. And, and the, third, the third tenant is focused on governance, delegates. And, and why this is important is these are the folks who are kind of themselves long-term committed to the, the governance literally of, of the protocol. They set the cultural norms. They vote on how the treasury might be allocated or, or dispersed in the future. And I think serving those users, in my mind, I think, you know, if the foundation in five, 10 years were to disappear, like these are the people who would come in and serve the same, do the same things that we're doing today, really focused on on, you know, the long-term support of the ecosystem. And those are the short-term goals, but I think that they kind of speaks to the long-term goals as well. And I think that TLDR there is we want to see multiple large, sustainable, successful businesses, programs, applications built on the protocol. Some of them will maybe be venture-backed. Some of them may be long-term grant-funded. Some of them, you know, maybe side projects which take off, but seeing a, a wide swath of really successful developers and builders on the protocol is really our, our long-term North Star. That's amazing. And you mentioned you just received 30 million to help you achieve that North Star, which is also great. And because you're on the token terminal pod, you know, I need to ask about financials. We're always interested in those. So uh, of that 30 million that you have now uh, received at a high level, could you speak a bit about your current like expense structure and how these funds are being used? Sure. So we recently received through a governance proposal. So I think a, a core thing to call out here is we are directly funded by the Uniswap Treasury. And the decision to disperse funding to us was made by uni token holders after reading a proposal that we wrote, which broke down our strategy, financials, roadmap, et cetera. The proposal was was actually for 46, approximately $46 million or so, which had about some buffer in it to account for potential price volatility of, of the uni token. 30 million of that will be used for grant making over the next two years. So we plan to spend 10 to $15 million per year on grants. So may end up being a bit more than two years that this lasts. And the remainder, 13 million or, or so after taking out the bit for price volatility is focused on, on operational costs, um, with our, our biggest costs being our people and legal expenses, of course. If we want to drill down a bit more into how we think about grant making, how we project um, that $30 million will be spent over the next two years, 
is across a few different buckets. The buckets are innovation, developers, researchers, LPs and institutions, and, and governance. And those are all, we, we are categorizing our grant making based on the kind of end stakeholder that, that the grant is, is benefiting, though I'll also call out that for many grants to developers, for instance, may end up benefiting other stakeholders if the developer is building an LP tool, for instance. So grant, grant making is defined by what stakeholder we focus on. The largest bucket is the innovation bucket, which is truly kind of focused on, on core innovations that benefit the protocol itself, whether it be novel incentive schemes. So we're currently doing a, a long-term grant, which entails a lot of deep research analysis and research and analysis from, from Gauntlet on how to run an efficient, effective liquidity mining program, for instance. It's about 50% of, of where we plan to spend the, the grant making capital amongst, you know, other areas of, of exploration, with developers being 25% and the remaining 25% split between researchers, LPs, and governance. Got it. That's a great breakdown. Thank you. Now, kind of on the allocation of grants in getting new innovative projects to spawn out of the Uniswap ecosystem, how do you decide on what projects you kind of want to, or what kind of innovations you want to give grants to external teams to, compared to what initiatives you want to build in-house or partner closely with partners? If you think of those three options of granting an external party versus building in-house at Uniswap versus making a close partnership where it's like Uniswap collaboratively doing with something, how do you make a distinction between kind of these three approaches in, in innovating? That, that's a great question. One thing I'll, I'll call out first is that we actually do very little in-house. We have a, a relatively small team right now, nine people. The way our team is structured is we have team leads across a number of different categories, which kind of map to those categories I just laid out in, in grant making. So a head of DevRel, head of governance, et cetera, head of growth who works on innovation and, and research. And they work with our grant making team, kind of like the core engine that that drives our ability to to make grants. And so how we think about, you know, what we do best is build strong relationships with those stakeholders that we represent with researchers, academics, PhDs, LPs, developers, delegates, learn what they need, build our, our own internal theses on where we can get the most bang for our buck return on on the grant capital dispersed, which, you know, are core KPIs that we often think about is net new organic order flow and, and volume and net new developers building on the protocol for the long term and building out kind of large strategic programs to achieve those goals. And so what I'm really excited about is this is a, a relatively recent shift in, in our grant making program. One of the, a big theme that I'll call out over the last year or so is we've really shifted from what the Uniswap grants program was, which is a, a program which kind of would take, take many applications from the community for grants that folks were interested in, in working on and select kind of a grant to, to, you know, make out of, out of that, that set. Over the last year, we've run a few iterations of more kind of like proactive is, is what we call it, kind of like proactive kind of grants through RFPs, requests for proposals, where we're learning from the community and, and translating that into grants we make ourselves. Because what we've learned is that, you know, there are a lot of folks who want to contribute to grants that are actually looking for more guidance on what to build. They want to build what will be highest leverage for the community. And many of the applications we UGP might have seen, there were many folks who kind of were guessing at what would be highest leverage. They're, they're equally happy and, and excited to kind of work on the things that we've learned from our somewhat unique position within the space. And so we're the next iteration of our program, the, the large program that, that we're building is something that we're really excited to launch more formally in Q1, where we're in the development stage right now. And I'm excited to see that. And I think, I think that that answers the question. I guess something else I'll add in terms of how we select making grants. So, so that kind of is the design process of the grant making. There is also obviously a, a lengthy diligence process related to the grantees who we speak to. You know, often there will be open calls with, with RFPs. 
and we have, you know, lengthy interview processes where we first will define internally and communicate the characteristics of the grantee that we're looking for. Depending upon the size of the grant, we'll do reference checks on, you know, the founders and, and builders. And that is also ob obviously a, a key component to uh, prior to actually dispersing the grant. Awesome. Thank you. Now, when we think of Uniswap and its position with the decentralized exchange market sector, I think from the outside in, it's it's become kind of universally accepted. And, and the truth, Uniswap is the DeFi OG. It is the blue chip protocol that is like the number one exchange. Internally, when, when you're thinking about how you're positioned in the market right now with competition increasing, et cetera, how would you describe the current state of the market and Uniswap's position within it from your point of view? I think today Uniswap is uh, still a, a leader within the, the market. You know, we're at about 65% um, market share ownership of, of volume, if you, if you check the, the stats. And as I look to the future where I'm really excited for Uniswap because from, you know, multiple different angles, Uniswap is, I think, making changes both on the on the protocol level. And then you can see things like uh, Uniswap X and kind of like intense architectures being built that I believe open up the flexibility, adaptability, openness to innovators who want to build and build to improve core economics of, of swapping or LPing, build for different kinds of users that will really serve to strengthen Uniswap's position as the liquidity layer of the internet. And I think just to give, you know, a touch a little bit deeper on two of those components, the Uniswap V4, whose release is dependent upon Den Kuhn, which I believe is currently scheduled for Q1 of next year, introduces this primitive of hooks. So hooks are basically code, kind of arbitrary code, which can do something cool, do something interesting, do something that enhances economics of a user, gamifies an experience, does something for a specific token-based community, et cetera, that can be injected into a liquidity pool by a developer. This does a few different things. It removes the, it removes trade-offs being built into a protocol. So whereas you know, Uniswap V3 had, you know, a specific curve that that was built into the protocol, you know, a specific TWAP Oracle was which was built into the protocol. Hooks kind of, you know, open up. It's it's like green field, like blue ocean. You, you know, you can build anything, you can build any trade-offs you want. It also turns developers into first class citizens in in the protocol in a way that I think will really enhance the network effects of of the protocol, increase the stickiness of the protocol and really turn it into a place where all liquidity kind of can, for all of those different user experiences and innovations that are built can and will flow. And I think when you bring intense into the mix, you know, this kind of like new primitive, which serves to provide best execution to, to swappers and think about how, you know, maybe the next generation of, of intense can become more composable with all the different hooks, which offer different kinds of user experiences. I think you get more complex kinds of swaps and transactions, which may be abstracted at the front end to swappers, but can potentially provide either truly like unique user experiences that aren't possible in the TradFi world at all, or are at minimum, you know, more competitive or, or equally competitive, at least to the kind of execution that you might see on TradFi sexes. And, and I think that that really excites me. That really excites me because when you look at Uniswap's market share or truly DEX market share, when you include centralized exchange volume, it's in the single digit percentage points. I, I think I checked earlier this week and I think DEX is in the scheme of centralized exchanges is like 4%. If Uniswap is about half of that, it's 2%. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of growth potential that we're excited about. And I, I think this next step of V4 in intense really will guides the path for us that, that's amazing uh why i wanted to ask that is because you know what we've seen it in so many markets that once you achieve a market leader position it, it's kind of easy to become comfortable and fall asleep at the wheel and i think like towards uniswap sometimes you see discussion around that okay what's going on but then when you see what kind of updates you're pushing and the way you speak about it 
it's great that you are very concretely taking lots of steps and pushing really highly forward to stay competitive, both in the DEX market, but also kind of positioning yourselves and understanding the entirety of you are a very small fish in the sea of total exchange volume, which includes centralized exchanges. So you're really like still an underdog in this space. I think so. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of room for growth. I think when, when we talk on our team, we talk about all of the things that are left to do for us to remain successful. I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it that way. I think there's, there's a lot of really exciting, interesting opportunity. And, and sometimes it's, you know, it's a matter of prioritizing what we think will be highest leverage, giving the unique place we are in, in the space. But I think there is, there's a long ways to, to go and we're excited to be a part of that. For sure. And getting, and speaking about getting to become like the liquidity layer of the internet, what, what does a successful Uniswap look like to you in practice? Yeah. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll get, go back to the fact that the foundation is an ecosystem builder and from, you know, there, there are a lot of different opinions and views on what a successful Uniswap looks like. And I think at the foundation, we're, we're very focused on what, you know, how we can contribute to a version of, of the most successful Uniswap. And we all really strongly believe that a Uniswap, which is an ecosystem, a Uniswap, which, you know, has diverse, varied sources of order flow, which, which it truly does today, where we're just, you know, in, in the market of even further diversifying it and, and expanding it across different kinds of applications and sources of, of order flow, really serves not only the mission to make Uniswap that liquidity layer of the internet, a liquidity layer which is credibly neutral, which is trustworthy, which is open, which is permissless for anyone to swap on, LP on, launch a, a token on, but which also benefits all stakeholders in, in kind. You know, again, like the more dependent you are upon, you know, a, a small set of, of applications or builders on the protocol, you know, the, the downfalls of, of centralization still, you know, apply. You're reliant upon order flow and, and work from, from those parties. And I think even over the last year, there was already a large ecosystem of, of builders and folks integrating with the protocol. And we've held hackathons, which have introduced, I think, at least 300 builders to, to the protocol, many of whom have gone on to build hooks. There are 70 hooks and were already built on Uniswap, uniswaphooks.com. You can check it out. And again, hundreds of, of developers have, have contributed to building those and we're months away from V4. I'm very excited to see like those hundreds of developers be able to, for themselves, create sustainable businesses, generate fees from building really cool hooks and user experiences on V4. And then in turn, again, you'll like see net new order flow, like, like if and when those hooks, which end user experiences, which are built, apps, integrations, et cetera, either improve the economics of interacting with the protocol or speak to a new kind of user experience. That is net new order flow that the protocol, which would not have seen, which will attract more LPs, portion of which will, will be sticky, which are, you know, like more passively managed, which just like makes it even more attractive for more developers to come on. So, so I want to explain kind of like further, but when I think of the, the foundation, a successful Uniswap is a flourishing ecosystem of, of builders, of researchers, of ideas, of how to contribute to this vision of a, you know, credibly neutral liquidity layer for that anyone can use. Got it. That's very well said. And is it fair to summarize that if going through also your Twitter, you speak about Uniswap is becoming a dev platform? Is that kind of what, what you just laid out there? Completely. Particular with, particularly with V4. So, so with V3, you certainly had a ton of builders building on top. I mean, aggregators, routers, active liquidity managers, but there's there's a disconnect, right? They're building kind of like a separate set of contracts which are interacting with the protocol and there's friction there, right? It's a little bit awkward, which is fine. I mean, that's the way a lot of composability works today. It's composable, but, but there's a little bit, there's a layer of kind of like friction there, gas cost inefficiency, et cetera. With V4, you know, a large component of that, not everything, there's still things that ha will happen, you know, off chain or, or outside of Uniswap. Developers have the ability to 
you know, have their innovations showcased and held and prioritized within the protocol. They're becoming first class citizens. They have the ability to make their ideas real, make the trade off set that they think makes the most sense for a given dex, make the say you have a researcher or a PhD who wants to implement a POC related to, you know, MEV mitigation or redistribution. They can make that go live within Uniswap and test that, hopefully with, with us, like a matter of days and, and potentially maybe weeks to, to get it live. And I think that is really exciting. And, and I think something else worth calling out, like it may be a, a better illustration of what this means is if you in the past had developers who wanted to innovate upon DEX design. Today, what that looks like is potentially forking a V2, a V3, forking another DEX out there building it, but then dealing with the issue of bootstrapping liquidity, which is not easy. I don't think anyone thinks that's that's easy. It's it's a struggle. You're either looking for your investors to lend you a decent amount of capital, but then you have to go market that you exist and get included in aggregators and routers. If you, with V4, that same innovator, that same builder can implement their innovation and DEX design within a liquidity pool on Uniswap, where there's already a lot of liquidity bootstrap and you're already potentially, you know, included in some of these routers or intense based systems. And obviously, you know, still attracting liquidity is a big question that that we're working through internally within our team. I think there's some really interesting work we can do there to, to set folks up for success. But that that becomes a lot easier, that the friction of innovation becomes much easier for developers. And I think that is really exciting for for us on the team. 100% agree. Now, next, I want to move on to briefly speak a bit about the state of Uniswap's decentralization, because the actual reason why we're having this this conversation right now and what sparked it was a tweet that we came across by a founder of another exchange that you had then responded to. And I'm paraphrasing here, but that tweet pretty much laid out that it's interesting to see that a lot of exchanges that started off more centralized have become over time relatively more decentralized, while more DeFi OGs, such as Uniswap, have started off more decentralized and over time become relatively more centralized. And you answered very well to that tweet in pretty long format that this is not true. It was very clear in your answer. And I wanted to have you on because the original tweet got quite a lot of engagement as well. So there obviously are people who think that way for some reason. So could you just here lay out the actual state of things in where Uniswap is in terms of decentralization and why it's not true that you have become more centralized over time? Yeah. Thanks for teeing that off. So maybe I'll, I'll maybe start by saying, you know, when we think about decentralization, what, what do we think about and what are some of the things that, that we care most about? The things I care most about and think the most about are, are one, if we're distilling it, 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 it kind of into one core thing is who are the people who truly care about a given protocol and who care enough to, if everyone else building on it were to leave, would band together and ensure it adapts, it stays alive, will bring, you know, regroup, bring their friends to continue to work on it or build on it and support it. And so we're looking at builders, we're looking at delegates, we're looking at community members, we're looking at all, all of those folks together. And if you look at that, and, and this is where the Uniswap Foundation has focused a lot of its time over, over the last year or so, if you look at V4 itself, the next version of the protocol that's coming out. It's currently being built in public and has had dozens, I think, I think in the, the 30s or, or 40s of folks, developers, engineers from around the world, some of whom are, are total anons, contribute and submit um, PRs, which have been merged to V4. So this is, you know, has not been done before from from Uniswap's perspective. The previous versions were built, you know, primarily by by one team. We're now looking at code, which is being built in in public. It's been live for five or six months now. We'll be, you know, open for anyone to review, submit PRs to until it's deployed sometime early next year. And I think that's really interesting and, and exciting and push, a push to be, you know, further along the decentralization spectrum. Out, outside of the core code, when we're looking at hook developers, which is an area that the foundation has really focused, we've seen hundreds of developers build and deploy 
uh, more than 60, 70 hooks, which again, uniswaphooks.com, you can check them all out there. And again, hundreds of developers per- participate in, in hackathons. That is quite a lot of developers who are continuing today to build on Uniswap. Many of those hook developers, hook developers and hook teams are either talking to us about potentially receiving grants to work on this over a long time period. Some, uh, some hook development teams are, have already raised VC funding to build their hooks on, on Uniswap. And again, that, that just speaks again to the fact that there are more and more builders who are, you know, there are some builders who are just, you know, working on a weekend hackathon project, but a large percentage of, of these builders are building because they see growth potential for themselves. They see opportunity for themselves. They see the ability to build a sustainable business for themselves, raise VC funding and build something real. Outside of that, one of the things I also called out in my tweet is from the governance perspective. So Uniswap governance, you know, gets its fair share of attention. And I think there, one of, one of the things that we've aimed to do over the last year is really distribute voting power to more voices within the community and, and ecosystem. And earlier this year, we ran a, a delegate race in which we got 65 new delegates signed up. And I think this is notable, like over the last three years, I think around 30 delegate profiles had been posted in the forum. So within the span of six weeks, we had double that new profile submitted. 12 of them received more than 100,000 union voting power. And anecdotally, you know, many of them, regardless of how many, how much delegation they've received, have began to participate in a truly real, meaningful, high impact way. You have one of them, BlockWorks Researches, has just submitted a proposal in the forum to start a monthly governance call. You have one of the audit teams who who received some delegation is working on a grant to help hook developers and hook users understand some of the standards for what a good or bad hook looks like. And I think there, all of those things are, are meaningful decentralization. Decentralization, not just in terms of, you know, numbers which can be fudged, you know, or or anything. And, and it's also not, you know, crypto Twitter narrative or like media narrative that, that you see. These are all like real stories, real people who are participating for a reason because they think it's worth their time. It's worth their energy, which wouldn't be happening if, you know, there was truly like a monolith that controlled everything like that. That just wouldn't be the case. Yep, I, I agree. Thank you for laying that out. Now, why do you think people have that misconception? Is it because there are so many entities within the Uniswap ecosystem that people are focusing on kind of the activities of the wrong parts of it in terms of what should be decentralized and whatnot? Or how, how would you? Well, yeah, I, I guess I would say one of the challenges that or one of the gaps that I'll acknowledge within the foundation's tool set over the last year has been a, a marketing arm, to be honest, to talk about and highlight a lot of the work that grantees have done. Right now, you know, we have 4,000, 5,000 Twitter followers. It's much less than other folks in the ecosystem. And I think one of the areas where we talk to our grantees and we can really continue to support them over, over the next year is through enhancing, you know, our, our capabilities and, and helping grantees in, in that way, I guess. Yeah, so so that's something I'll I'll call out. And what I would also say is of course, you know, Uniswap Labs has has a lot of followers and a lot of people who have followed them from the beginning. Rightfully so, they've they've been a leader in the space and very successful in the space. And I think that that can be true at the same time that like labs can build incredible consumer facing products which are onboarding the next, you know, million, tens, hundreds of millions of users into the space. While it is also true that hundreds of developers see a place for themselves on Uniswap V4, see potential for themselves to contribute a different set of kinds of user experiences or the ability to build POCs of like the the research that that they've done. I think both things can be true at the same time. And I think, you know, we're we're excited over the next year to to highlight the fact that there is so much exciting activity happening with the builders in the space, with all of the work we're doing with the academics and researchers in the space within governance, et cetera. 
that's well said. Uh, it's extremely important to also know where your weaknesses are so you can kind of put effort onto those and hopefully start getting the word out e even more in the future to kind of correct some of these misconceptions because, you know, it's never fun to see a discussion that is not aligned with what's actually happening, <laughs> happening internally, but, you know, it happens. It's okay. I mean, that it, it, it does happen from time to time to Twitter. I think we've seen it happen before, you know, uh, but I don't know. I think we're, we're really excited about everything that we're doing in the foundation. And we think, we think everything that we have planned for the next year will hopefully, you know, we're excited to talk about it a lot, but, but it all, will also just like speak for it, maybe not speak for itself. Cause we're also going to talk about it a lot, but I think we're really excited to, to really show, show everyone some of the big programs that we've been working on. 100%. Now, we spoke a lot about the importance of developers, their role within your ecosystem, and how Uniswap is becoming a dev platform. I want to speak about another pretty important stakeholder to Uniswap, which is the liquidity providers. And to, to kind of preface this discussion, could you speak a little bit about who the LPs are on Uniswap? So what does the composition of your like LP base look like if you're able to shed any light on that? Yeah, sure. So internally within the foundation, we categorize LPs into four four core categories. So active LPs, passive LPs, active liquidity managers, and then token projects. And just to give a, a few details on, on each of these. So the passive LPs are the LPs who leverage this kind of unique facet of AMMs where, where you can, you know, submit, like submit your liquidity, send your liquidity to a liquidity pool and, and kind of set it and forget it, leave it there. So not really actively managing their their liquidity, just submitting it, uh, letting it be. Active LPs tend to have their own bespoke strategies, will be rebalancing when some market conditions are met or after kind of a certain amount of time period and employing strategies that may be more akin to what you see Similar, somewhat similar to what you may see market makers do in, in TradFi. Active or automated liquidity managers, so ALMs, apps like Arrakis, like Gamma, Sommelier, et cetera. These are applications which maybe retail or, or newbie LPs or folks interested in LPing but who aren't, don't have their own strategies yet can use or leverage to LP on their behalf. So often there are, you know, some some set of strategies that each of these applications will employ that automatically rebalances if if a set of conditions are met. Lastly, and this this one is is a little bit different than than the other folks who may be LPing to see some kind of return or to express a view that they have on on a given set of, of tokens. This is token projects. So these are, you know, projects which launch and who want to see a stable price for their token in, in DEX markets, P particularly, you know, before for some of these projects, they may not automatically be listed on Coinbase or or other exchanges. And they may want to ensure that there's liquidity for their token and that their token has a somewhat stable price. So you also see token projects themselves launching liquidity pools and managing liquidity. And, and here are the those are the objectives versus the objective being, you know, to, to maybe generate a return more expressly. Got it. Uh, that makes sense. And as competition kind of increases throughout the DEX market, I would assume that it becomes increasingly more important to make a better and more enhanced experience for LPs to keep them engaged. What is Uniswap doing on that front at the moment to kind of help LPs be profitable and have, have a good experience? Completely. So there are a few different things I, I can talk about that we're doing. And and some of it falls into that research category of research grants. And here I would say, you know, there the the headline is there are a lot of really smart people and teams. So some of the best researchers in the space, like flashbots, et cetera, some of the top researchers thinking about Lever, for instance, who have written really you know, cutting edge papers, like thinking about LP return profiles and where LP losses may be coming from. And we have a number of initiatives going on today to help implement, turn those, turn some of the ideas stemming from that research into realities that can benefit LPs today. So specifically right now in DevConnect is, is going on and Ken Ng, our head of applied research, is putting on 
a researchathon with Slashbots to explore with, I think, a few dozen, maybe up to a hundred folks, I forget the exact number, think through how hooks can work with swab, swab, how hooks um, can be built to mitigate MEV and redistribute MEV to core Uniswap users instead of being captured by, you know, arbitragers or, or bots. And that's just the, the beginning, you, you know, where we're thinking about how else we can work with folks within the community. So a, another initiative is the latest in DeFi research, otherwise known as TLDR. This is a fellowship program, a fellowship and a, and a conference that will have in Q2 in New York, in which some of the, again, leading folks in DeFi have stated problem statements or research areas that will require more focus are working with fellows who submitted applications to work with them. And these are our topics like, you know, improving like MEV auctions, for for instance, like the same set of existential questions which are faced by DEXs and, and DeFi. And the work and research is currently undergoing and will result in the conference next year. And, and the hope there is, you know, that will, all of this will be open sourced and we hope the thousands to tens of thousands of people who read the resulting work will result hopefully in, in implementations that, again, improve, you know, obviously Uniswap's user experience and the economics of interacting with the protocol, but but also, you know, benefit the space at large, which is really exciting and, and really cool. I think more concretely, because those are in the research area, from the hooks and V4 launch perspective, we are currently finalizing some of the public goods hooks that that we're planning to fund the development of. We're also working on a set of, you know, standard template hooks, which folks can leverage the design of. And, you know, a, a core thought there and, and some of the subsequent grants and works we'll do with the community is, is for sure hooks, which benefit LPs, which, you know, may be composable with other DeFi protocols to boost their returns. Obviously, some of the work in MEV mitigation will reduce LP losses. And overall, that, as you can kind of tell, is, is a big focus of, of ours and how we think about how our grant funding is, is dispersed. Got it. That, that makes a lot of sense. Now, do you have data off the top of your head of what portion of LPs like currently are profitable? I feel for me that that'd be like super interesting. Yeah, it's a good question. So one of the downsides to Uniswap being totally permissionless is we, we, it's like, we don't have data on like who are all of the LPs and that is by design and many LPs and unsurprisingly, sometimes the LPs who are most likely profitable and successful, who have the most successful strategies prefer to, you know, if not be anonymous themselves, prefer to keep those strategies and their returns anonymous. That being said, you know, with the anonymity taken taken into account, we have a grantee right now who is working on an analysis of returns generated by some of the automated liquidity managers. And, and I can kind of like cite some of the preliminary statistics from that. I won't go into depth because it's, it's still being finalized and we'll release it over the next few months. And don't you know, some of this may change as they're they're kind of like finalizing the research, so maybe changed in the final version. But some of the initial statistics, looking at like on an, an aggregate level for ALMs that are managing liquidity, contributing to stablecoin pools, you're you're seeing a, an APY of about around two percent for assets like ETH, Bitcoin, median kind of average return a little bit above that. You know, three percent for more long tail tokens. It's it can get a, a little bit higher for more advanced, for really advanced strategies, can get up a, a few percentage points to around like four or five, six percent. And then when you add incentives into the mix, uh, obviously that gets much higher. I think we're looking at like average numbers of like 15-ish percent, though just anecdotally, I've seen some pools with liquidity mining incentives get up to the, you know, high double digit, like triple digit APYs, depending upon the, the pool size and the size of the incentive. So kind of varied. Obviously, this is a this is not these are not, you know, comprehensive holistic statistics, but they they, you know, just could speak to it to a subset of the kinds of returns that users of these kinds of applications see on average. 
Got it. Yeah. I'm glad you're able to share that. And we will keep in mind that it's still preliminary. So disclaimer that it might change. That, that, that's that's interesting stuff. Now, just quickly wanted to ask on the from a trader's perspective, uh, I think like the somewhat obvious question would be, oh, what assets can people trade on Uniswap on which chains for what fees? But uh, we don't have to spend time maybe speaking about that. What, what I'm more interested in is like the current situation versus the future. So from a strategy point of view, what type of trading moving towards being the liquidity layer of the internet, do you more want to start facilitating that is not yet happening on Uniswap? For example, tokenized stocks, real estate, like real world assets, are, are those like active focus areas right now? Or from a trader's perspective, what, what can people expect to be coming on chain? Sure. Yeah. So Uniswap, Anyone can launch a liquidity pool for for any kind of digital asset on Uniswap, of of course. So, I think the the teams who are are working on those those new kinds of of assets like can always launch those liquidity pools themselves. And obviously, with hooks and the innovation that 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 unlocks, the unique or the more unique kind of user experiences and and things that may be required. In order to trade those assets, swap those assets, LP for those assets is can be implemented by by anyone. In terms of our focus area, really for for at least the next six months, the focus is truly on providing the developer tooling and the the basics, like the template that any builder may need to create a really positive, high impact user experience from the developer perspective and, and builder perspective. So. In terms of, you know, the kinds of use cases we're focused on, it's, it is more focused on, you know, improving the economics for LPs, you know, generally providing other kinds of public goods hooks, which are generally needed by, by the space. And so as for the next six months, it, it's not a, a super high priority to focus on any specific use case. That being said, I think that the, the reason why we're focused on this for the next six months is that the teams who are working on those use cases will still be able to leverage a lot of the tooling, education, templates, scaffolding that, that we're, we're building to build those things themselves. And, and that's, you know, I think the, the work that we're doing right now, we, we hope will lead to that outcome of, you know, just like exponential innovation, it, just making it much easier for others who have good ideas to make those good ideas happen without us necessarily being overly didactic about what specifically is built at, at what time. Got it. Now, we covered the supply side, the demand side as well. Uh, I think the third area I want to touch on quickly is like the token holder and their view on what they might be interested in. First question there would be kind of similar to your LP base. Who are the current uni holders? Can you describe the composition of your cap table? Yeah. So, so again, you know, like permissionlessness, anonymity, all of these things, like there is, it's, it's not possible by design to have like a complete picture of, of what this looks like, but I, I can talk through what, you know, the, the things we do know. There are around 370,000 uni token holders and 34,000 uni token holders have voted, which is like a pretty decent percentage, I would say, actually, I was reviewing that recently and I was kind of surprised at how high that was. In terms of the the breakdown of delegates in the space, there are, of course, you know, some some investors and that's, you know, a delegate type that a lot of folks like to focus on. I want to focus on some of the other kinds of delegates that we've seen, particularly emerge over the last year. We've got many community members and builders within the community who have gained a lot of delegation over the last year, particularly through the delegate race. So Arrakis and Gamma, two ALMs, Ottersec, which is a, an auditor who's, who's been really involved in some projects that the foundation has, has put on over the last year. Professor Guillaume Lambert, who's a founder of Panoptic, which is a grant recipient from UGP, which is, you know, since raised VC funding. Blockworks as well. There are professional delegates. So Monet Supply and Mika and Timu, two kind of delegates who are also really active in Maker and, and a few other ecosystem. GFX Labs, which is a kind of professional delegate, but also builder within the ecosystem. University blockchain clubs, other folks who exist within the crypto space. So SHE256, l 2 b and those are those aren't all of the delegate types. And you can 
If you're interested in seeing more kinds of delegates, particularly delegates who are open for more delegation, we built out a platform that's very focused on enhancing the delegate delegator relationship this past year called Uniswap Agora. And if you go to vote.uniswapfoundation.org, you can check out all of these delegates, look at their voting history, learn more about them. Why do they want to be involved in Uniswap? And I'm actually glad you kind of pivoted that to speak more about delegates, because when we think of like traditional companies, the cap table is somewhat important to analyze from an investor's perspective. But then again, in crypto, it's much more important to understand who the delegates are. Yeah, this is not a cap table, to be clear. Yeah, or I wouldn't use that. I wouldn't use that term. This is definitely not. not. It's much more important to understand who the delegates, delegates are, how they voted, what kind of their goals are for pushing it forward. Now, another question, finally, on the token holder part, what I think people are quite interested in, if we think about just the U uni token and risk associated with holding that, how would you define the biggest risks faced by Uniswap on the market right now? One of the areas that the foundation has been focused on, as have many key players in the space, has, of course, been in on the you know, regulatory risk and, and particularly some of the proposals which have made, been made by some agencies over, over the last year. And in reviewing some of the pro proposals, specifically some of the, the ones that the foundation has submitted comment letters on, and these are the, the SEC proposal to change the definition of, of broker and the more recent IRS proposal that would potentially put at risk protocols to have to submit informational reporting to, to the IRS. I think what is, what is lost in some of these proposals is truly some of the, the basics on decentralization on, you know, I've been talking for almost an, an hour now on all of the different kinds of stakeholders and contributors who, you know, are working on top of and contributing to Uniswap. I think it, it's really clear and, and obvious to, to me that there's like, there's no one thing that that is really like even if someone wanted to like be the thing that that controlled the protocol, it, it wouldn't be possible, particularly looking at Uniswap's makeup and seeing it's it's not upgrade upgradable. It is governance minimized. And I think the the reason why we submitted comment letters, like a common theme across the two we've submitted thus far, is is explaining that, is is explaining not only the like technological and infrastructural basics that like mitigate or mean that like there is no controller and in, in, like it is technologically and infrastructurally like not possible for that to exist. And also highlighting the the truth that that there are these hundreds of contributors to to the protocol. And hopefully what we're doing something to to educate these agencies on how these things exist. We're, you know, not against common sense regulation that that protects consumers, but the regulation must also recognize the recognize the benefits of this technology. The fact that, you know, in many ways, consumer protection is baked into the, the protocol. We know the rules. We know how it works. And it cannot be changed. It cannot be changed by design because there is no one can update it or, or upgrade it. Recognizing the benefits of this rather than you know, not understanding it and trying to regulate it away and try to make it work like broken systems that um, have been around for decades isn't the right way. And so while we, you know, as, as many others in the space would say, like some of these regulations are, are a threat to the space, we and many other, I think, really good faith actors are, are writing these letters and to try to communicate this to, to folks at these agencies. 100%. There is an unlimited amount of education to be done. But I am very glad that you are doing it. <laughs> I really enjoyed this last hour. I think that was actually a pretty good uh, note to end on here as well, that it's a never ending process. But I hope that this shed quite a lot of light to listeners on what is happening within Uniswap ecosystem, how you guys are contributing to the growth of the broader DeFi ecosystem, not just Uniswap, but yeah, amazing stuff. I uh, really re appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, we should definitely do it again because we, of course, want to also play our part in educating and getting the world out there. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this.